Welcome to Polypharmacy in Older Adults Challenges and Techn Technological Advances webinar. Uh, my name is Mine Orlu and I'm the lead for UCL Celebrate Innovation Hub. It's my great pleasure today to chair a virtual event brought to you by UK Spine and UCL Celebrate. Before we start, I just would like to kindly remind you uh, to all of our attendees to keep their microphone and cameras turned off during the webinar. And if you have any questions, any remarks, please feel free to add them to the chat box and hopefully if time allows, uh, we will try to answer them at the end of our webinar after our invited speakers talks. Advanced therapeutic approaches are required to reduce the impact uh, of many age-related comorbidities. UK Spine is building a national network of collaborators to address uh, this issue. And UCL Celebrate aims to drive innovation by delivering cross-disciplinary projects in research and related to knowledge exchange activities in partnership with researchers, innovators, local communities, charities, industrial enterprises, and clinicians. UK Spine and UCL Celebrate would like to bring their complementary focus by organizing today's webinar. This is my great pleasure uh, to introduce our invited speakers, uh, Professor John Overington, Professor Nina Barnett, and Dr. Yonika van Leuven. Professor Overington joined the Medicines Discovery Catapult in 2017 as a Chief Information Officer, where he leads the development and application of informatics approaches to promote and support innovative post-patient drug discovery in the UK through collaborative projects across the applied R&D community. Professor Barnett is a consultant pharmacist with a proven track record in both strategic and operational development relating to clinical pharmacy and clinical leadership in the area of older people. She is also a visiting professor at Kingston University, London. Dr. Yannika van Leuven is a visual artist and neuropsychologist. Her PhD research, which took place between the Wellcome Collection and the UCL Dementia Research Center. Her focus was on the relationship between visual imagination and the social brain in neurologically healthy young and senior adults, as well as people living with dementia during her PhD studies. In today's webinar, she will briefly touch on the various factors that influence people's sensory visual experiences and will relate this to the context of pharmaceutical design. I would like to thank to all you uh, for giving your time and showing your interest to join us in today's webinar and uh, UK Spine and UCL celebrates brilliant teams for organizing today's event. Now I'm deeply honored to offer today's invited speakers our most grateful welcome. I'm truly delighted to welcome you here today uh, and I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Professor John Overington. Uh, thank you very much. I'll just turn on, um, turn on my video and then um, share my screen, and then we'll be ready to go. Oh, uh, do I need to continue? Let's try. And share. And hopefully now you can see my slides. Um, the, so today there's um, a, a sort of introduction to some of the work we're doing here at the Catapult um, in collaboration with Spine and also in, in collaboration with some, uh, some researchers at UCL um, around um, moving towards drug repurposing for an elderly uh, population. And um, as the introduction said, I, I work for the Catapult, uh, the Medicines Discovery Catapult, um, and we're tasked with supporting translational drug discovery science um, across the UK, um, taking things from um, academic labs, turning them into products, helping the birth of companies, new ideas, and, and new therapeutics. So drug repurposing is a, uh, a very popular uh, thing at the moment, probably from, from COVID. Um, you've seen um, two drugs that are now approved or, or approved somewhere in the world for, um, for COVID, remdesivir, which was actually repurposed or repositioned from uh, an Ebola targeted agent um, and also dexamethasone, arguably a sort of repositioning, but, but you know, certainly in a, in a new um, disease context. Um, and also some sort of failed examples of repositioning. So I'm, I'm sure, uh, depending on the audience, that, that there could be a lot of questions. But um, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, look like, despite the initial promise, that, that they're not going to be uh, repurposable for, um, uh, for, for COVID infections. There's two types of repurposing, the finding a new clinical use for an approved drug. Of course, those things are quite simple to, or relatively simple to try directly in, 
experimental medicine, get um, ethics approval, go for a trial, um, and so forth. And another subcase, an important subcase, is, is drug rescue, where there's a compound that got to late stage clinical development, um, but it didn't work in its initial indication, but could be useful in a new therapeutic um, area or, or, or new disease setting. The, uh, usually at this point, um, people bring up the example of sildenafil as an example of a sort of repositioned drug during um, clinical development. This, this is my, one of my um, other favorite examples. Um, so a, a drug, uh, bimatoprost, um, for, the, for the chemist amongst you, you, you may recognize this looks a little bit like a prostaglandin, and that's the sort of the, the pathway that this, uh, uh, that this drug works. Um, initially, uh, the drug was approved for ocular hypertension, um, so uh, for the treatment of glaucoma. Um, but during use, it was noticed that it, it had another um, uh, benefit. Um, what it did was it made eyelashes grow thicker uh, and more curly, um, and also changed the, uh, the appearance of the eyes, so the eye lining looked darker um, and, and more, more striking. Um, and you know, not that it's really a, a serious disease, but hypotrichosis. Um, uh, bimatoprost has now been through trials. It, it's demonstrated that it's effic efficacious for this, and, and um, now it, it's uh, um, uh, an example of a sort of repositioned uh, drug. Um, another one um, is uh, thalidomide, um, a drug that was really approved prior to. Um, you know, modern standards of, of efficacy and safety. Um, and we're all aware of the um, enormous um, impact of uh, uh, thalidomide when it was first used in, in, um, uh, in, pregnant, uh, in pregnancy for morning sickness. However, because of its very deep wired sort of um, manipulation or modulation of, of um, uh, various uh, essential biological pathways, it's now a blockbuster drug used in patient groups for which pregnancy or, or teratogenic effects um, are, are less, far less likely to, to impact. So thalidomide is now used for multiple myeloma. A number of follow-on drugs have got even better profile, um, better clinical profiles uh, than the original um, thalidomide. Um, but but this, is, this is a blockbuster drug and, and delivered huge um, you know, patient benefit. Uh, another use of thalidomide is for leprosy. Um, and again, you know, huge patient impact there in, in, a, in, a, in a very, very debilitating, um, debilitating uh, disease. The other feature of repositioning is that there's a lot of hype there. And, and of course, when scientists find uh, an interesting potential new use, they're very motivated to publish, they're, they're motivated to make it sound very good and a, and a forward um, uh, and a forward um, uh, advance in a field. Not many scientists say we found something with modest effect on some disease phenotype and so forth. So, so just picking out this paper at random, that, that there's, a, there's a very large number now of, of um, uh, repositioning publications, which you know, are early stage, which sound very promising, um, but you know, probably in the description of the work, you know, that there's some element of gilding the lily. Um, but without knowing the drugs or not without knowing what to look for, um, it's quite difficult to filter some of, um, uh, some of the claims. So this is um, uh, a drug, uh, oranifin, um, a, a long established drug approved in, in many territories through the world um, for use against these escape pathogens. So effectively antimicrobial resistance, a very major um, uh, sort of cause of death, uh, especially in elderly populations. And, and this is, you know, they, I guess they, they screened in some, um, a series of antibacterial assays. Um, they, they found oranifin and, and modified um, the drug a little bit to come up with better um, sort of examples of this. So they were using really or found oranifin as a lead. Um, but in the, in, the, in the statement, they say, um, oranifin was subsequently approved by the FDA in 1985 as an oral anti-inflammatory agent for treatment of RA. Its safety has been well documented with no reported concerns in terms of carcinogenicity, serious side effects, or other long-term safety issues. Oranifin has been shown to be active against a broad number of, of thiol-dependent reductases and so forth. So, 
So you know, that, that's, that makes the drug sound pretty good. You go to the prescribing information for the drug. It, it's got a boxed warning. So, that, so this is, of course, um, for those, those of you with any, uh, any sort of um, prescribing experience will know this. It, it's, a, it's an alert to look out for stuff because it's not a regular, easy to use drug. And, and in this case, this is towards some of the, the more extreme um, ends of, of warnings and precautions. Um, you need to be a, a specialist in chrysotherapy, which is the useful of gold therapies, thoroughly familiar yourself with the toxicity and benefits. Um, the, um, and, and a second feature, uh, again, to do with, with the actual use of the drug, um, or ranafin itself, so, so this structure here, has effectively got zero systemic exposure. It's never been detected in the blood because it's very rapidly metabolized to just colloidal gold. So, so you know, nanoscopic um, uh, particles of gold, which have got some, uh, some activity. So a lot of claims in, in, in particular in, for in vitro screening for drug repurposing don't stand up to the scrutiny of, of testing in particular around dosing and safety um, of the drugs. And that's a major theme of the work that we were, um, that we were doing. The second um, general um, sort of expectation setting slide, uh, really important um, message, I think, um, for, for just setting expectations about repositioning is, although everyone knows key examples of repositioning, minoxidil, sildenafil, um, bimatoprost, um, arguably thalidomide and so forth, there actually aren't that many across all drugs. So there's about 1,500 approved drugs, and e even people deeply versed in the, in the field, they, they struggle to get into double digits of, of credible examples of drug repositioning. And, and for me, a very influential um, paper, you know, I admit I only came across recently, was a really nice um, uh, analysis of repositioning of drugs. So they looked at um, 834 compounds in development, tracked them through. Um, 167 of those, oh, so uh, 834, Sorry. were approved for the original indication, so the original disease. And then once approved, people started to look for alternate indications, um, clearly positioning an anti-infective against another virus or bacteria is more expected to be successful than against, say, um, rheumatoid arthritis or, or you know, hair loss or, or, or whatever. Um, so there's a higher success rate uh, repositioning a drug in the same uh, therapeutic um, setting, um, less in um, a different therapeutic area. For the drugs that fail, so 667 of those, 104 were tested in um, a, a different disease but the same therapeutic area. Of those, only nine were approved, um, 65 in a different therapeutic area, and of that 65, only six were approved. So overall, the success rate for drug repositioning or, or, or repurposing is about 2% across both launch drugs and um, late stage clinical um, uh, compounds. So it's a relatively rare event, but when it, it, it is found, it's an incredibly useful thing for disease because you've got a drug ready to go. You don't have to optimize the compound, do safety testing uh, and so forth 12, 15 years away from the patient potentially very rapid access to a, a, a new medicine. And this is why it's so seductive um, in, uh, uh, in drug discovery and a major focus of a lot of, uh, a lot of research. The um, beautiful paper, uh, you'll get the reference in the next slide, published um, I think two years ago now, uh, was analysis of CPRD, so a very large collection of, of um, primary care uh, data uh, from the UK and then the binning of disease occurrence over time. And of course, the diseases in, in neonates uh, and, and young children, toddlers are very different from those in adulthood um, and in, in, in old disease. So there's you know, these beautiful um, images, you can't read this on the screen, um, I, I sort of uh, uh, appreciate, but, but it's, it's interesting to, things, to see things like acne um, almost exclusively localized to the teenage years. And, and you know, it's good to know that you've got another 70 years ahead of you without um, acne. Um, but, um, you know, more seriously, I guess, as you go on to um, uh, elderly patients, 
you see a, a, a very different pattern. And, and of course, everyone's familiar with diseases that are, are primarily uh, occurring in the, in the elderly. So this is, this is the paper here um, from uh, UCL um, and, and you know, a lot of researchers from HDR UK. So um, things like urinary incontinence, um, gout, uh, just pick out a couple of things, cardiovascular disease, macular degeneration, cataracts, deafness, um, all the sort of diseases you'd expect with, uh, with the elderly, dementia starting to break through. And if you look at the previous um, sort of uh, frequency um, diagrams, yeah, dementia is, is, is a very rare disease. Um, cancers uh, and infectious disease. You, you go on to age 80 plus and everything just gets a little bit more extreme. Dementia has tripled in, in occurrence, cataracts larger, um, cardiovascular disease still very high um, uh, morbidity, um, but, but the real striking thing is, is the uh, increased occurrence of, of, uh, um, of infectious disease, so acute infections um, essentially all over, the, uh, all over the body. So the diseases of the elderly are different to the diseases of the young, and also the diseases of the el elderly is a major theme of this, this webinar tend to come in clusters. Um, so you, you typically don't have a single disease, a, a sort of mono uh, disease. There, there's bundles of, of related or associated um, diseases that come together, but also clusters of unrelated disease. So dementia plus uh, infectious disease or, or, or cancer or um, whatever. So comorbidity um, and high disease toll are, are sort of um, key in, in the elderly populations. So stepping a little bit back to um, some fundamentals of drug action, um, but hopefully this will explain some of the, the key principles of, of the safe use of drugs or the safe discovery of drugs for use, to, use in an elderly population. So this is a typical um, plasma concentration curve for an orally dosed drug. You swallow the drug, it dissolves, it's absorbed through the gut wall typically. Uh, so there's an absorption phase and then an, an elimination phase. And ideally, the shape of these two curves or the ratio of the two uh, exponentials is such that you can dose the drug once a day. Um, that's a sort of classic um, sort of dream spot for a, a pharmaceutical, both for adherence um, and, and also for uh, just manufacture and so forth. A key parameter though, is this Cmax, the maximum concentration that the drug gets to in the um, uh, in the circulation. And of course, this is a gross, gross, gross um, simplification. Different factors are there for, of course, topical um, and, and injected drugs. But I think the sweet spot for wide adoption of drugs would be an orally um, dosed drug. This Cmax is so important because the side effects, effectively the tolerability of a drug, are very closely linked to the highest concentration that a, that a drug gets to. Um, so typically, you would want to cover for a 24-hour period uh, the effect of the drug against its target, so suppression of, of um, uh, cholesterol synthesis or regulation of blood pressure and so forth. Um, but one of the prices of having that extended duration of action is high um, Cmax, or a high peak concentration, for which the drug can start to interact with other targets. Often, those interactions are quite benign, they've got no effects. But when it's a, an important um, uh, protein or, or, or gene, like an ion channel, a classic example would be HERG, um, so a, a, an ion channel that, um, that's important in, in cardiovascular uh, function. If your drug starts to tickle up that or modulate that, that ion channel, um, you can potentially get um, QT prolongation, um, death in, in extreme um, cases. So there's a series of, of targets that you want to avoid in the body as well as the target responsible for your your efficacy and and life would be great if that curve was pretty consistent across a population however it's not so there's a wide range of physiological environmental and genetic factors that control the the metabolism or the or the exposure of a drug in the body uh, and we'll run through those um, and some of them have, have got particular um, sort of importance in an elderly population. The other interesting thing in this field is the vast majority of human pharmacokinetic data comes from healthy um, young uh, volunteers, often disease-free. Um, and so 
the physiology isn't necessarily comparable and the, the way the drugs behave isn't comparable to a, a, a different, um, different population. So one of my favorite examples of an environmental interaction that's got you know, quite profound um, implications for drug safety is um, grapefruit consumption. So grapefruit contains an inhibitor uh, of a, a major drug metabolizing enzyme, um, uh, a, a, a cytochrome P453A4. Um, and because that 3A4, the, the cytochrome, is responsible for clearing the drug from the body, if you inhibit that enzyme, you get far more drug absorbed and you get far more exposure of the drug to all tissues in the body. The inhibition is irreversible. Um, so it takes time for the body to replace the 3A4. So grapefruit can have quite a, a strong effect on, on both the absorption, efficacy, and safety uh, of a drug. Um, far from being a health food, you, you, know, you can argue that the, the grapefruit is, is like an anti-health food for people that are on um, certain classes of drug. And you'll often see grapefruit consumption listed as a contraindication um, in these prescribing information. The other um, general feature of, of drug use in the elderly is that drugs interact with each other's metabolism um, and uh, uh, distribution, excretion, and so forth. So multimorbidity, the co-occurrences of disease in elderly patients leads to polypharmacy. So the, the taking of multiple drugs, um, and this gives rise to a very, very complex an arguably unstable function where you have drugs, different drugs, potentially way more than two, interacting with parts of the body that are inducible. So some drugs induce the expression or suppress the expression of other proteins. Um, this can be at a, a sort of simple transport level or at, at a deeper uh, transcriptional level. And then on top of this, you've got a whole bunch of changes in the body, typically body mass, fraction of um, fatty tissue and so forth in the body that are associated with with aging so typically elderly people have a relatively high um, uh, water content in their body and and less um, uh, fatty tissue and the fatty tissue acts as a natural buffer for lipophilic type drugs so the exposure in, of drugs in in both um, elderly people and also in in performance athletes who, who who also tend to be quite lean or have low fat content um, is, is very different. I meant to say for the grapefruit juice, grapefruit juice can easily affect a 15 to 30 fold difference in the exposure of, of a drug. So equivalent to taking 15 to 30 fold the normal dose. So you know, a simple food can have profound effects on, on drug safety um, and um, you know, grapefruit consumption itself um, has led to unlocking the mechanisms of withdrawal of a large number of, or reasonably large number of, of drugs historically. There's a couple of other changes in physiology uh, that are crucially dependent with this interplay of drug um, and environmental interaction. So often elderly patients have renal insufficiency. The, the kidneys can clear less uh, uh, glucuronidated or sulfated drug than before, so it tends to lead to higher uh, plasma drug levels. Um, hepatic insufficiency is again very common and typical in an elderly population. Um, so this, the, the liver is the site of, of first pass metabolism, so that the, the body's defense mechanism against xenobiotics. So again, if, you, if you've got a, a poorly functioning liver, you, you tend to have higher drug levels, higher incidence of side effects, and again, different drugs modulate both different subsystems in, in the kidney and the liver uh, that can lead to non-linearity or, or poor behavior of, or poor mutual behavior of, of drug action. Um, one of the other recent um, advances is that we're starting to appreciate effects on other parts of the, the, the body associated with, with aging. So the blood-brain barrier is a natural protective system that precludes the access of compounds to, to brain tissue. Um, the, uh, some drugs need to get into the brain to act, of course, but, but the majority of drugs don't. And typically chemists try and 
optimize compounds for peripheral diseases to not get into the brain because it reduces the chance of side effects. Um, Alzheimer's disease, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease and a number of other neurodegenerative diseases um, break the integrity of this blood-brain barrier um, through mechanisms that we're now just starting to understand and potentially give rise again to rolling the dice or, or increasing the chance of, of side effects from a, a drug that's normally restricted to peripheral distribution um, to getting into the, uh, into the brain. Of course, there's some general patterns that have been well established empirically um, and then um, studied using sort of, I, I guess, machine learning approaches to try and establish classes of drugs that should be avoided uh, in the elderly. And, and probably the classic is um, uh, Beer's criteria or Beer's list, a series of drugs that should really be avoided in, in the elderly. But there's a number of drugs for which there's a need to prescribe in the elderly but are contraindicated. So things like uh, drugs like opiates, um, you know, a lot of uses in, in um, elderly uh, population, um, but um, the, you know, the, the side effects and the risks, the therapeutic index of, of opiates in, in that population are uh, uh, even smaller. The other really um, complicated thing for, for thinking about medicating elderly populations and in particular using combinations of drugs is that not all drugs in the same class have got the same properties so you can't just curse or bless all histamines um, uh, histamine uh, targeting agents for example um, a nice example would be uh, statin drugs so two statins atorvastatin simvastatin both widely used in in um, populations for um, the control of, of high cholesterol levels, reducing cardiovascular um, uh, risk. Um, very different lists of drugs that um, interfere with the metabolism of the other. So if you're on a torvastatin, the prescriber should check that there's, there's no real um, uh, uh, overlap with uh, the, or no concurrent use of these drugs. Um, and a torvastatin is a relatively clean drug and, and given the, um, the particular therapeutic uses, so, so antivirals, um, um, antifungals, and so forth, it, it's probably unlikely there's, a, there's an overlap there. Simvastatin comes loaded with far higher risk because of far larger number of drugs that have got known, demonstrated, poor drug-drug interaction behavior, um, and so forth. And again, as a general rule that, that people are, um, are starting to, to sort of incorporate into prospective analyses, is that um, lipophilic drugs, so drugs that like to dissolve in, in fatty tissue, have higher risks generally than polar drugs. And even though simvastatin and atorvastatin inhibit the same target, they bind at the same site, they've got very different physicochemical um, uh, properties. And you know, look here, grapefruit juice, you know, specific call out for grapefruit juice and um, uh, and the use of uh, simvastatin, whereas atorvastatin is clean from, uh, from that risk. Um, so one of the major projects we have underway uh, at the moment in the group um, is bringing all of this drug-drug interaction, this pharmacokinetic exposure, some pharmacogenetic data, safety warnings and so forth for um, about the 2,000 worldwide approved drugs to try and develop some heuristics, some simple rules that can be used to prioritize drugs, new drugs, for use against new diseases in an elderly population. But most importantly, those drugs have inherently low um, or, or inherently low chances or reduced chances of, of safety risk and will play well with the other drugs that are typically used in an elderly population. So hopefully that's been uh, interesting. Um, uh, and so forth. Um, it's certainly been fun to pull together the slides for this, uh, for this presentation. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. This has been an amazing summary, actually, of um, the changes in, in an elderly body and how these changes actually are pronounced 
due to multiple uh, medicine use uh, at a later stage in, in life. Uh, so thank you very much for reflecting your opinion from pharmaceutical sciences discipline to uh, mention us about the, the main challenges uh, that we need to think about and the main implications you know, of polypharmacy uh, considering from the physiological end. And this is my great pleasure now to invite uh, Professor Nina Barnett uh, for, for her talk. Uh, so I would like to hand over to you, Nina. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me all right, Mina? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Good. Okay. So moving on from John's presentation, what I'm going to do is try and take some of what he said and give you some practical ideas about how we translate what we've learned into practice for older people. And what I'm hoping to do in the next 20 or 25 minutes is to answer three questions. Number one, what can we do to support us managing polypharmacy in practice? How can we use patient engagement to contribute to medicines optimization? And where does medicines adherence fit in the bigger picture of reducing inappropriate polypharmacy and optimizing medicines? Just for clarity, let's get some definitions in here. Polypharmacy, what isn't it? It's not about taking too many medicines. It's about talking to people about the right amount of medicines for you. So polypharmacy's got lots of definitions with numbers of medicines, four, five, eight, ten. You'll come across many, many different definitions in terms of numbers. But what I would suggest is that if you are working with patients, you think about talking to people about the right amount of medicines for you. And the same goes for deprescribing, a word I would never, ever use with patients. It's not about stopping your medicines. It's about trying to reduce or stop or review medicines again to work towards the right amount of medicines for you. So what resources are there to use to optimize medicines in polypharmacy? So I've put a big list here, which I'm going to go through to give you an idea and I'll show you one or two examples. Oh. My computer seems to be doing its own thing. Um, a few different examples. I imagine any of you in practice will be familiar with the NHS Scotland and Scottish Government uh, document, which was created in 2012, updated in 2015, and the most recent update was April 2018. Um, it's called Polypharmacy Guidance Realistic Prescribing, and you can download it from that link but there's also an app you can use on your phone there are lots of different features to it i'll go through a couple um, and i think it's extremely useful in actively managing polypharmacy when you're doing medication reviews if you want to read about the bigger picture of polypharmacy the king's fund report in 2013 and also um, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society have a report, which I haven't actually put on this slide. Um, if you look on the RPS website, you can find it, but the King's Fund report is also excellent. Um, to give you a background, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in the UK did create a document with an excellent appendix of all the different resources. So if you're an RPS member, I suggest that you go and have a look at that. That's really helpful. Um, NHS Wales created some useful guidance for prescribing in frail adults and not only do they have a full guide they've got a one-page very practical guide to what medicines you really need to look out for in frail older people and just as John said there may be long long lists of medicines for example in Beer's criteria of things we need to be careful of but he pointed out there are sometimes times where you need to use a medicine that actually comes onto your contraindicated list how are you going to balance what the person needs from you, what the medicines can offer with safety and efficacy? And for those of you in the UK, um, the Prescript guidance is very helpful. They started a program in 2011 and have got many, many resources to support um, reducing inappropriate polypharmacy and promoting safety prescribing. Um, if you haven't had a look at the NICE multimorbidity guidance, that has a lot of great principles of how you can manage those conundrums that you come across where people need medicines that actually are on potentially inappropriate lists. And they also have a really good database of treatment effects, which you can download um, or you can view with your patients to look at numbers needed to treat and think about whether a medicine is actually in risk benefit terms appropriate for your patient. If you want some guidance on stopping medicines, there are some very good evidence based guides on um, the Canadian deprescribing network. And as you can see at the bottom, you have got the link to the Royal Pharmaceutical Society guideline. 
Just to give you an example, uh, Beer's criteria have been continuously updated. Just for a bit of historical context, Mark Beers was, uh, is a consultant geriatrician and he first created a list in 1992. He was the first person to think about highlighting to people to clinicians that actually some medicines were not appropriate for use in older people and we've moved from his first list in 2000 uh, in 1992 to the latest beers criteria in 2019 which again takes much more note of the complex holistic view that we now all appreciate around polypharmacy and I've highlighted in green here the bit that I think really helps us to interpret the beers criteria, which are the criteria are unable to account for the complexity of all individuals and patient subpopulations and should be taken as guidance to support clinical decision making and not the final word. And I'll leave you to read the rest for yourself. But I think beers criteria are potentially very useful if you want a guide to the kind of medicines to be careful of. They are, that is part of the toolbox of managing polypharmacy. Now I call those explicit criteria because they're lists of specific names of drugs to be careful of. Some people are really comfortable with specific lists and they like them and they feel secure with them. Other people prefer to do their medication reviews using a more implicit method. And the implicit criteria, there are two examples there. One of them comes from Tessa Lewis in the British Medical Journal um, from quite a long time ago, you'll see, 2004. And what she talks about is she talks about how you need to have a conversation with your patients to identify what's the need and the indication for the medicine. Ask the patient themselves about what they think of the medicine, how they're managing. What te do the tests say? What does the evidence say? What does the patient say about adverse events? What's the bigger picture around risk reduction? So for example, the nice multimorbidity guidance that the, the uh, Excel spreadsheet is very helpful. And can you simplify things or can you switch them? So that's Tessa Lewis's uh, guidance. If you're more of a flowchart kind of a person, I'll offer you Doran Garfinkel's uh, GPGP algorithm, which is good palliative geriatric practice algorithm, if I remember correctly. And what he does is he gets you to follow your way down a list here. Is there an evidence base for what you're doing? Does the indication seem valid? What about ADRs? If there are ADRs, you're going to stop. No ADRs, relevant um, indication. Then you think about adverse symptoms and signs, other drugs. Do you need to switch? Is everything all right? Can you continue? So I'm offering you these really to say to you, are these methods that you might find helpful in considering with your older pa patients how to review their medicines? This is something that we use in our local trust and it's been modified from the stop start tool, which you might, um, you might recognize the name of that from the work that was done in Ireland with um, Dennis Omani and many other colleagues. Um, so we took the stop start tool and it's been shortened and modified into a symptom based tool originally done by Chelsea and Westminster Hospital as part of their um, collaboration for healthcare leadership and research project and we've with permission started using it and this is a very simple method of looking at polypharmacy and adverse effects. Instead of thinking about the drugs themselves it thinks about it from a clinician point of view when someone presents to you. So what's the presenting problem? So on the back of it, you can see problem bleeding. What are the drugs you need to be careful about? Problem constipation. What medicines could do that? Problem falls. Is it anticholinergic? Is it ACE inhibitors? Is it benzos? What's going on with opioids? What about a vasodilator? Is the problem confusion? Anticholinergics being very commonly implicated in that. And if there's a metabolic disturbance, electrolyte imbalance, think kidneys, damn drugs, metabolic disturbance, think about your uh, diuretics, etc. So that's a symptom based tool. And then finally, I've just given you a few examples of other tools that you can have a look at here. Um, MedStop is really quite helpful because you can put the load of drugs in the online form and it will come up with some recommendations for you. And then if you're looking at anticholinergic scales, I've given a few links down the bottom. So that's the polypharmacy tools. Now let's move on to what are we trying to achieve here in relation to optimizing meds and polypharmacy? We want to do 
what Sackett told us to do all the way back in 1986. He and colleagues told us that we wanted to integrate the best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. We're good at best available research evidence. And after a while, we're quite practiced at clinical judgment. But those two on their own won't make that stool stand up. We've got to think about the patient's circumstances and their values and their beliefs to get that stool to stay on its legs. So, how can we approach this in a person-centered way? So with colleagues, Lely Obo and Katie Smith, um, we developed a little process here to try and help people to think about how they might have a conversation about medicines with patients. Find out what's going on with the patient. Gather the relevant information. Do your medicines reconciliation, make sure you've got that right. And then hear from them the narrative of their experience. Define their context, what's happening in their lives. What do they want from their medicines? What medicines work for them? What medicines are they worried about? And once you've done that, you can use all your tools to identify potential risks with medicines. Once you've got your view and their view, you can put those together and assess the risks and benefits in the context of that individual patient. You have to imply your clinical judgment and personalize therapy at this point here when you're deciding actually what you're going to review. The next steps are for you to agree the actions, whether you're stopping, starting, continuing, reducing doses. Communicate what you're going to do with everyone that needs to know and empower the patient to talk to other people. So they may need to tell dentists that they've made changes. They may, to, may need to tell social carers as well as you doing it through your formal systems. And remember, this is a cycle. This is not a one-off type of review. If you're looking at polypharmacy, people change and needs change. Therefore, the need for medicines will change. Therefore, appropriate and inappropriate polypharmacy will change over time as well. I wanted to show you the NHS Scotland's seven step process, which you can get from downloading their app. And I think this is really helpful in thinking about the process of how you manage a patient, what's important to them. And you saw that was at the beginning of the cycle that we just had a look at. What are the essential meds? What are the unnecessary ones? What are your therapeutic objectives? What are theirs? How does polypharmacy fit into theirs? If their therapeutic objective is to take just enough medicines to cope, but not, not too many for them to feel unwell, unwell in terms of they can't swallow so many medicines, you might have to shrink down the number of medicines just to meet their therapeutic objective. And you'll look at cost effective medicines. And at the end, of course, is the person willing and able to take the medicine that you've come to a conclusion may be useful. I wanted to share with you some questions and my colleagues from London Northwest who are on this call will recognize these slides. They may have recognized a number of them. Um, these are questions to support person-centered conversations. Before you start making assumptions about what medicines you do or don't need to change, you have to listen to your patient. You have to find out what they know, what they know about their disease, their medication, the reason they've been given the medicines, maybe what they're worried about what their questions are. And you need to deal with all of that stuff before you wade in there with everything you think needs to change. And when you educate them, you're going to be educating them in response to what information they've given you, as well as weaving in key safety information. This gives you the opportunity to provide an evidence base and help them balance risk and benefits for their situation. Now comes the tougher one. How do you empower someone to decide what they want to do about medicines rather than assuming that because they've agreed they're going to take it. You need to have a conversation with them about risks, benefits, alternatives and no change. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But if they decide to take the medicine, you want to help them move from the abstract, I'll take it to when am I going to take it? How am I going to take it? What do I need to do to remember it? How am I going to check if I've been doing well and I've remembered it? How will I know if the medicine's working? What do I need to do to check that that medicine's working? And by articulating all of those in a conversation and getting them to tell you, then they'll have a much better chance of adhering to those medicines. 
I'm coming back to how to empower people. You might want to have a look at the Choosing Wisely website, which talks all about how you have conversations to empower people to make decisions about medicines, talking about risks and benefits in their context about what matters to them, alternatives that make sense to them. So it may be that somebody who's been prescribed a statin wants to try lowering their cholesterol in other ways first, or maybe they want to do nothing. But maybe what we need to do is listen and help them have the evidence they need to make an informed decision. Why is person-centered prescribing important? I've put this up here to say you may recognize this photograph of Nadine Montgomery and her son um, in relation to the Montgomery judgment, which is where the importance of shared decision making and benefits and risks all comes from. She was a lady in a very sad situation that uh, she had a very large baby. She is a woman with diabetes and a small person and her baby was starved of oxygen for 12 minutes and she argued eventually successfully going through the courts over nearly 15 years that she should have been given, given the option of a caesarean section and had explained to her the risks and the benefits in her context because of her diabetes and her small stature and not had the assumption made that a vaginal delivery was appropriate. She had the choice taken away from her and her son was injured. Um, in relation to medicines as adherence, as we come to the end, there are some things I think that are useful to think about when you're talking to people about adherence. Find out from people what they think about their illness in the first place, what they think's caused it, how long they think it will last. This work um, by Howard Leventhal has been around for the last 30 or 40 years. He is a uh, head of school, I think, at Rutgers University in the States. And he talks about finding out from the person what their illness means to them so that you can talk to them about medicines in a way that makes sense to them. For people who don't think they need their medicines or, or for people who are very worried about their medicines, they're not very likely to take them. This is an example of one piece of work using the necessity concerns framework, which was originally Horn and Weinman's work in 1999. But what it says is even people who really think they need their medicines and aren't worried don't necessarily take their medicines all the time. So what that shows us is this is part of the story of medicines adherence, but not the whole story. The traditional view is that there are some people who can't take their medicines and some people who won't take their medicines. And actually the reality is there are quite a lot of people with both of those things going on. So they'll have practical aspects they struggle with, but also perceptual aspects in terms of believing whether the medicines work or not. And the latest model of adherence comes from Susan Mickey at UCL. Um, and that talks about the COM-B model, which is, are they capable of taking the medicine? Do they have the opportunity to take it? And are they motivated to do it? So there are lots of different factors around medicines adherence that you can add into your conversations um, to make them person-centered, to support shared decision-making, and also to empower and enable people to take the medicines they want to take in the way they want to take them. And here's an example of how you might use com -B in a consultation if you identify that someone perhaps has poor knowledge of a disease or poor understanding of their medicines, perhaps their memory is declining or they don't know how to use equipment, their capabilities impaired. What about the opportunity, physical and social opportunities, if they don't believe in you or they don't believe in healthcare systems as they are? What about partners and other social support such as carers if those people aren't encouraging them to take medicines you can do what you like but you can bet your bottom dollar they're not very likely to adhere if they have a high medicines burden that makes it physically difficult and then of course we have motivation and that speaks to the perceptual element that we were talking about before do they believe they need the treatment are they worried about side effects have they built it into their everyday practice we all know that it takes lots of different uh, um, repetitive actions to build things into your everyday practice. I believe the literature says between 20 and 30 repetitions to form a regular habit. That's quite hard. Let's recognize that when we're prescribing a new medicine. So as I come to the end, I want to say to you that minimizing inappropriate polypharmacy in practice needs you to know what tools there are to identify high-risk medicines. 
you need a structure for your consultation so that you can go through in a systematic way. You need to understand the influences on adherence so that you can manage them with your patients and support your patients with person-centered conversations, both with them and with their family. And I'm going to finish off because I'm going to hand over to Janneke in a minute. And I'm going to ask you, what's the difference between those two tablets? Two capsules, I should say. And I'm going to finish with a little story. And this story goes like this. I was asked to speak to a patient about taking some medicines after a stroke. And it was in the days where you were prescribed aspirin and dipyridamol. And the patient said to me, oh, I'm really comfortable with the aspirin. Yes, I know about aspirin now. We've had it in our family for years. I explained it was a low dose and that was all fine. And the aspirin was all good. And then they took out this large container of medicine, which contained many, many, many capsules that looked just like those two on the screen. And the patient picked up the medicine and held it within their finger and thumb like this. And they said, look at that. So I looked at it. And the patient said, I can't take that. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean. And they said, but look at it. So I looked at it and they said to me, look at it. It looks really dangerous. There's no way it's safe for me to swallow that medicine. And so I'm not going to say any more about that, except for the fact that he and I were both looking at exactly the same medicine. And what we saw were two completely different things. So now I'd like to hand over to Janneke to talk to us a little bit about medicines and colour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina, for a brilliant presentation and a very enticing introduction. I'm glad that you followed up with the, the pill image with, with the anecdote yourself, because uh, I was thinking, help, I can't see the difference, but that was exactly the, <laughs> the point you were trying to make. Um, I'm going to keep this very uh, brief, as promised, because um, I want to leave a bit of time for questions that the participants might have. Um, but as um, Mina um, already mentioned in the introduction, I have a bit of a hybrid uh, poly background, I would say myself. Um, I uh, was trained both as a visual artist and a neuropsychologist, and um, my PhD research um, combined the two areas. And what I'm going to talk about briefly is indeed um, the many factors that influence how people experience colors and how this is relevant in the context of rock design as well. And um, Nina talked a lot about taking the, per, the patient's perspective into account when you talk about the willingness to take drugs. And I hope to um, bring attention to the fact that you might even need to go further back and also really carefully consider how you design the drugs and take many more factors into account as to what people might think of those drugs when they're asked to take them. Um, I'm going to share a slide with you too. On the line now. Um, so this is um, one of the figures of my research um, which shows how people in my study uh, rated the valence of colors that I showed them. So um, I had this uh, shows the difference between um, neurologically healthy young adults and senior adults. On the left you will see young adults, on the right you see senior adults. And there were different conditions. So I showed people colored prints, both on a computer and as high quality photographic prints. So that was a comparison between different presentation uh, modes. And I also showed the colors in different contextual situations. So I showed them both as color fields and as color rooms. And I will point out a few things that are quite striking. Well, first of all, you will see that um, there's quite a striking relationship between the hue of the color and also the brightness of colors and how people rate their valence. So the brighter colors, the more saturated colors, are generally rated more positive in both uh, young and senior adults. And the darker, uh, muddier colors are generally rated more negative, both by young and senior adults. And there's one particular color I briefly want to point out, which is, um, I don't know, if my pointer actually works but if you look at the lowest row and you will see that most clearly um, in the young adults uh, rows there's this, this muddy color of brown 
and that is the color Pantone 448C. And I included that color in my research because an Australian uh, study amongst a thousand smokers, which had been commissioned, commissioned by the government, um, showed or like found that this was the color that most smokers found universally uh, like a negative, had a very negative effect on them. So that's why this color uh, for the smokers amongst you, this is the color that's now the generic color of uh, cigarette packages and tobacco products, not only in Australia, but also in the UK and many other countries have adopted the color. And the fact that I was able to reproduce that in my own study does give an indication that this color does seem to have particularly like universally disliked properties. Having said that, there are also differences. So it is also dangerous to assume that colors have universal effects across cultures and across ages, because in my study, I found differences between young and senior adults. And I also found differences um, relating to the context and the media in which the colors were presented. And that also connects to what John touched on in his presentation, saying that there's different diseases that occur more in younger generations than older generations. And um, you also have to consider that people's preferences for colors also change um, across the ages. And that is also obviously relevant when you think about how you're going to design your drugs. So um, I found that older um, adults were less sensitive to the saturation, the brightness of colors, but um, in response, they liked them better. So that was an interesting finding. And another finding was that younger adults were more sensitive to the material presentation of colors than senior adults. Well, having said that as well, you also see that the study I did was on color fields and rooms, which is still a very different story than when you talk about drugs. Because as Nina pointed out in her anecdote, when it comes to drugs, what people are going to consider is, am I comfortable with digesting this drug? Am I comfortable with eating this? And, and um, in that respect, um, what's very rele uh, relevant to take into account is that the way people appreciate colors is very much related to their experiences throughout life with those colors, the uh, natural associations they have, and which has been described as the ecological valence theory. So certain colors have natural associations. And John um, had an earlier um, example of a patient who didn't want to take a particular drug because it was colored. A capsule was black and yellow, and that reminded the person of a wasp. And nobody wants to digest a wasp, obviously. So um, that's just one example. And it also touches on uh, the example Nina gave about what you see in a particular pill and what kind of associations you might have with a particular color might be very different for another person coming from a different generation, different culture, etc. So there's many, many factors to take into account and it all points towards the value of personalized rock development. And I will stop here because we're running out of time and then there's uh, still a little bit of time for questions. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Yannicka, Nina, John. Uh, it has been such an eye-opening webinar, uh, I think, uh, to realize in real means that multimorbidities are, you know, the reality and there's a pronounced, you know, case that we need to do more research for older people. Uh, it's related with multiple drug use, uh, polypharmacy, and this subject is uh, a subject, uh, in my per very personal opinion also, which needs to be uh, discussed and analyzed in a very multi-poly, you know, dimensional level. So it's not only related to uh, a, a, a PK field, it's not only related to the administration and use related field, but actually it really requires uh, a joint effort to, uh, as Nina, you kind of said, to, to meet with the therapeutic objective of the, the, the older patient and maximize the therapeutic uh, outcome uh, for the aging population who are suffering from multimorbidities. 
So I'm really conscious uh, about, the, uh, about the time. Uh, so I think we, we only have a chance to take one uh, burning question. Uh, from one of our uh, attendees, I can see the question, are there any opportunities to use social media channels to engage elderly patients? So I just would like to invite our uh, speakers uh, to hear about their comments as an answer to this question. Nina, would you like to go first? I think you are muted. Okay, so it's really important not to make assumptions about older people and social media. I think it's a really great question, Monica, thank you. Um, and also older people are a spectrum of people. So what do we call older? I would certainly say that if you're going to class older people as people over 65, the generation certainly in the UK between 65 and 80 may well be able to use social media um, for leisure and therefore using social media channels to promote um, and engage older people in better use of medication, adherence, etc., is an opportunity. I'd say probably in the over 80s, it's less common now. But of course, as time moves on, the people who are now in their 50s will be in their 60s and their 70s. So it's absolutely the way forward. And Thank I'll you. stop there. There's another one for Janneke here, I can see. Yes, um, I can hopefully uh, uh, take this question very quickly. Uh, one of our participants is asking about the color preference uh, in the context of medicine, uh, whether it has been explored in, in synthesis. Uh, um, in yes, like it has. Um, there's a good review paper um, on that, which um, I could share if there's uh, any interest later on. But basically the bottom line is that it's, um, all the research that has been done so far has focused on asking people, for instance, to, so they would be presented with a, with a, a range of colors and uh, pills in different colors, and then people would be asked um, what kind of associations people had, like for instance, but then they were given fixed options. For instance, they would give uh, um, the option is like a red pill, is that um, activating or does it have like a re depressing effect? And then what was found in general that the red pills have a more activating um, association and blue pills are associated more with narcoleptics and white pills are often considered more neutral, etc. But what's interesting is that there's basically no research, at least that I could find, where people were given open questions as to what kind of associations do you have with this pill? Because that's still a very different story. Because when you ask people a leading question, they might categorize those pills. That's still not the same as to would you actually take a drug that looks like this? And um, so there's still a lot of um, uh, research to be done in that area. Thank you very much, Yannicka. Uh, uh, this has been a fantastic uh, webinar uh, about polypharmacy uh, in regards to challenges and opportunities in this field. Um, and um, John, you know, your presentations have been excellent uh, to actually show us uh, what are the you know, main issues that we need to address from pharmaceutical sciences and clinical sciences perspective. And uh, you give us the hope that there is definitely growing intellectual thinking in this field. There are very useful tools uh, that are being used from uh, you know, clinical uh, sciences, uh, from clinical experts, uh, and as well as the pharmaceutical experts you know, in the drug discovery and, and PK uh, sciences. So if I may request just one, one final line as a take home message from you, uh, that will be brilliant. Uh, I would like to invite John uh, for, for his uh, final remarks. Oh, oh, thank you. I, I, I guess my, my exposure to the, the field has really highlighted this, this human component and the psychological component of, of a medicine. Yeah, I, I'm very much a reductionist <laughs> and see things in, in sort of very systems and molecular terms. And it's certainly been really eye-opening to, to see the, the sort of consumer end of, uh, uh, of this sort of work. It's fascinating, actually. Really fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, Nina, would you like to share your uh, final views about the topic? So I think my, my take home message would be individualize, individualize, individualize. We've got the opportunity to use evidence. Let's do it. There are tools out there, more tools than we know what to do with. Help you with the evidence. And don't forget there's a person there with a life, with wants, with hopes, with dreams. If you can put those two things together, you'll help people get the most out of the medicines they choose to take. 
Excellent. Thank you very much for these are really, really memorable words and they, they have critical importance. Uh, Yannicka, just very final uh, words. I know uh, we are running out of time, but from a visual artist point of view, from a neuropsychologist you know, point of view, what would be one line, you know, key message from you, uh, how we can improve, you know, the medicine design uh, for helping people uh, who are suffering from uh, multiple diseases? Well, I think um, what also this webinar shows is that uh, taking a multidisciplinary approach, and um, what Nina also says, um, taking a, a person-centered approach is crucial. And um, there's a growing interest also in, in like collaborating across disciplines. And I think that's really going to improve patient care in the decades to come. Thank you very much. It has been a fascinating webinar and uh, as John said, really eye-opening. Uh, I've learned myself uh, so much in this field and I think it will trigger uh, many studies and uh, many you know, further thinking in this field. So I would like to uh, thank uh, John, Nina and Yannicka uh, for, for their time, for sharing you know, their expert opinion. We are really uh, appreciative of your, uh, your you know, time and, and your expert opinion on this field. I would like to thank UK Spine and UCL Celebrate for organizing this, this webinar and uh, I would like to also express my thanks to our excellent audience today. I can see a few more remarks uh, that they are sharing in the chat box. Uh, unfortunately, as the time is limited for today's webinar, we are not able to take any further questions, but definitely we would like to keep in touch from UK Spines and UCL Celebrates and, and we very much hope to see you in our uh, next event. Thank you very much and goodbye for now. <laughs>